So I've been on a spiritual path, like probably all of your listeners and, and everyone, but really since I was a very small child, and I would say in a very dedicated way from a little kid. And I always thought, how do I get closer to God? How do I find God? That was my big search and continues to be my search, though I have less question about how to find God. It's more of like, how do I now embody that which I know God to be as much as possible. And so when you do deep meditation and you really do connect to the truth of who you are, the one thing that you have the realization of, and this was the name of my radio show, that it's about oneness. It's about knowing that there is no place that I end and you begin. And so if you come out of meditation and the connection to the divine and your goal is not to serve the world then you need to go back in meditation the, the goal usually is that you have this realization that you know you're my sister that's my brother whether it's an animal or a tree or or a person and so of course you want their welfare and so you have to serve them in some way and it can be many ways it doesn't have to be um you know, giving money, it can be giving time, it can be doing something that makes a difference that helps them live and thrive. And because it, the people starving in the street are me. Mm. The people who are suffering are me. And so I feel, and I've always believed in this sort of enlightenment that is all inclusive. I feel that though most certain people become enlightened, I feel that humanity becomes enlightened when we're all serving each other because we realize the oneness. So that's what service is about. Welcome, welcome to this episode of Daily Soul Bard Show. I am your host, Bola Abimbola, and this is a show where we interview authors and coaches and entrepreneurs for their expert insights for the expansion of collective consciousness. And today I have a very special guest, Krishna Priya Newman. Welcome, Krishna Priya. Thank you. It's really lovely to be here on your show. I'm I'm excited to share this with you. I've known, <laughs> you, I've known you for a little bit, a few minutes now. Yes. But it's nice to see you in a new uh, in a new atmosphere. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for joining me. I'm so excited. I'm going to read a bit about Krishna Priya's bio before we start. So Krishna Priya is formerly known as Karen Newman and is an established spiritual teacher, intuitive psychic, channel and yoga practitioner. Based in India since 2022, she commits her time to various forms of service, including teaching meditation, mantra, and the welfare of street dogs. Educated in theatre in the US and a seasoned musician with several jazz and blues albums, she founded the Dutch Blues Foundation to support the music scene in the Netherlands. As a respected psychic and channel, she has been featured on podcasts and docu-series such as The Kevin Moore Show and They Call Us Channelers, and has appeared on the Gaia TV show interview with E.D. with Ruben Langdon. Krishna Priya hosted own, um, her own radio program about oneness on the Enlightenment Evolution Network and currently runs the human colony, Ukala, channeling webinars every week, focusing on channeling and spiritual awareness. Yes. Welcome again, Krishna Priya. It's yes. always nice to see you on Ukolo when I join every week. Thank ah. you so much for joining me. So tell us, Krishna Priya, why did you change your name, first of well all? Yeah, I, I didn't change it myself. Uh, it was a name given to me by my divine guru, uh, Puja Swami Chitanan Saraswati Ji in India. He is the uh, head of Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, which is where I live most of the year now. And 
there it generally comes around in in the Indian Hindu culture that well if you don't have a Hindu name but very commonly your guru will give you a name that is supposed to represent your character and and also what you're supposed to strive to be so for instance my name means krishna priya that means the most beloved of krishna but it's double so if krishna is the supreme god it would be the most beloved of krishna but also that i should love god the most so my my striving should be that i should return that love with equal equal uh, energy of, of loving God the most. So it's a beautiful name and I'm honored to have it. And, and I was given it uh, in after Diwali in 2022, I guess. That's what I got it. It's been more than a year now. Um, but it's a, uh, Diwali is a festival and, and it's an auspicious time. And that's when I was given the name. And it was during a time when I took a vow called Diksha, which is a vow of service. So um, it, it just means that I'm dedicating my life to serving the world, others, whatever that might be. It can be doing, you know, social media for the ashram, but it can also be feeding the poor, teaching children, whatever, whatever is necessary is really what I've made a dedication to do. And then I'm, and, and generally you're given a new name and you, uh, are given a mantra and then you, you know, proceed to live your life like that. And I'm on the path of renunciation. I'm, I'm going to be eventually a monk. So in the sannyasi tradition of Hinduism, eventually, not yet. I'm, I don't think I'm, <laughs> I don't think I'm ready yet, but yeah. So that's, that's how it came about. And the name was given to me. Tell us a bit more, Krishna prayer about, the service, your spiritual service, because you have found a deep spiritual path, quite a deep spiritual path dedicated to service. Well, you know, a bit about that. Yeah. So, and it, it became very true for me, uh, even though like I was talking about it for many, many years and my guides had talked about, you've got to serve, you've got to serve. And, and I didn't know what that meant, you know, I didn't know if that meant that had to be my job that where I got paid, but then that's a little different. That's more like you're providing a service, but you're not necessarily serving, you know, serving is, is giving without any need for any return at all. You know, the gift is the service this and it's, and it's, it's done from a place of, of bhakti of, of bhav. It's, it's done from a place of love and devotion and I can tell you that, especially when it comes to working with street dogs, who I never thought I would work with them. I never thought that was going to be anything I would do. It's, it's, it's a drive. It's a need. It's, it's, a, it's a passion beyond other than I just need them to be okay. I need them to eat. I need them to have medical care. I need that they live and that they're not dying. I, I need for them to be okay. That's my only goal. I don't have any designs on any kind of platitudes or gratitudes that I would receive. It's really about them and their welfare. And I never picked it. It really picked me. <laughs> and in such a sort of subtle way, but it, it has been going on like five years now that I'm feeding about 30 dogs twice a day. And the change that I see now with them, the dogs themselves, but also the community, as I've pulled people in, because you can't do it always, always by yourself, but I'm not a structured organization when it comes to this, but just the changing of the sort of the hearts and minds of the people around where they really have become community dogs. They all have names. They all wear collars. They all get medical care. They belong where they are, which is really important that they're safe. It's, it's, it's because of only just feeding them. Every day, twice a day, playing with them, petting them, talking to them, having other people see that joy, and then they pick it up. And but, but it's only been feeding. You know, I, I can't take any credit for 
anything else other than I just, if, if they don't get fed, I can't breathe. Mm. I literally can't, I can't breathe. It, it bought, you know, so the, so when I first went to India, uh, I met a dog and I, what, what happened was a woman was leaving the ashram and she'd been feeding this one dog who had showed up and she said, I've got this food and there's this dog and I've got to leave and there's no one to feed it. And I went, I'll feed it just like that. And that was it. That it was the beginning. Mm. And then when it came time for me to leave, I was like, I can't stop feeding this animal. So now I'm just going to leave. I don't know when I'll be back. If it's a year or, or you know, three months, five months. And so I found someone who could continue to feed and I was sending food. And then when I came back, you know, the person says, well, we've got another dog here. Can we feed this dog? And it was like, yes. And we just kept saying yes and yes. And all of a sudden we've got this pile, <laughs> pile of animals. And through that, we've met local NGOs who do medical care and, and it's really shifted. And we, now they, now people are bringing beds to the ashram for the dogs and, um, providing, you know, little different things. It's just, I would say in the last year, I've seen a major shift in the people's perception of them. They used to be skinny and have sores and, you know, were begging all the time. And now they're fat and happy and content and playful and they don't argue and, and they just are good, good, good little beings. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, I always, I've come to the conclusion that like, we call it Dharma, your path, your divine path, your Dharma. I don't believe that we pick it. Mm -hmm. I think it picks us and mm -hmm. it could be motherhood. It could be, you know, human rights. It could be changing a law in your city, your state, establishing something, but it's something that becomes this pull that you can't, you, you can't not do it. I, I just, if you didn't do it, I think you could go literally like, I, I would have a really hard time not being able to do it. I would find a way to do it. And even during the, um, during the pandemic, um, the lockdown came and we were in the ashram and we were locked out. We couldn't go outside. And there's all of these animals that now I can't feed. And I went to the head of the ashram, who is uh, my guru, and I said, you know, I have to feed them. I, I can't, I, I have to feed them. And, and Sadhvi Bhagavati Saraswati, who's my other spiritual teacher there, she said, no, you have to, you have to do it. You have to follow this, because she knew that this was really my path. And so they facilitated me being able to arrange for food for all of these animals that otherwise would have been cut off because once everyone went inside, all the street vendors were gone, all the stores were closed, all the restaurants were closed and the streets were empty. And there was just these sort of animals that live outside that had nothing. So it, it was a really uh, pivotal time for me to really, you know, realize that the feeding that I was doing even though I knew it was literally the thing between them and dying or starving. Mm. And it just became so real and undeniable. So it, it's, it's been a big journey and a lot of learning and really it's not about me. Mm. It's, it's, it doesn't matter. It's not about me. It's about them. And that's a really strong path that I, that I didn't expect I would have never sought out, mm -hmm. you know, but it's something that's uh, undeniable for me. Very fulfilling. I can yeah. hear it in your voice. I can hear it. I can feel it. This is this is a very powerful dharma, and I love the word dharma, that dharma. purpose, because we all have something. You're right. I think mine is motherhood. Yeah. Being, you know, being a mother finds is something that I find very fulfilling. And it's on my mind 24-7. Yeah. And I'm waking up when I'm whatever I'm doing, it's there. It's 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 a part of me. Yeah. And um I I love that. And I think it's important to also say, because it's a very powerful reflection. This this um what what we get when we serve in this way is a very powerful reflection of love. 
Yeah. And it's important for us to really embody that love even more. It's like yeah. a circle. That reflection comes to us because we are creating this. We are manifesting it. And when it comes to us, it's important for us to embody that love, our own self-care, because we can get so passionate about what we really become, um, you know, fulfilled in, but we are not looking after ourselves enough. And I think this is something that I wanted to add to that, yeah. that it's important to find it and then to embody the love that comes back to us. Um yeah every step of the way. I mean, I do see the blessings in, in, in the, that come just in the facilitation of being able to do more and give more. And, you know, it, it is, it's a circular thing, yes. you know, very circular. And as a, like, as a mother, I mean, my God, you know, you take this little being from, you know, birth to adulthood, guiding everything you are. They say in Hinduism, you talk about your divine feminine, divine masculine, your Shiva Shakti energy, your, your Krishna Radha energy, all of these beautiful divine, but you are that mother goddess for your child. You are the embodiment of that. And everything they know, they know from you. They know from your example, from your words, from your touch, from your voice you know they know it from from what you give what they observe with you everything everything they know they know from you it is a it's one of the most powerful dharmas that you can ever have you are the you know queen of their life and it's such an incredible responsibility you know and so i mean what's more beautiful than that but you are you're bringing you know, they are your projection into this world. They have actually sprung from you as we have all sprung from the divine, but they are literally springing from you. So, you know, how incredible is that connection? But there's so many dharmic, beautiful paths. And you can have more than one dharma. It's not like this is your dharma and nothing else. I mean, your dharma can be a mother, to be a teacher, to be anything. But when you realize the sacredness of it, mm. that's where you can really put your heart and soul into it as opposed to seeing it as a burden. You know, a lot of people see their dharmas as a burden. Oh, I have to, you know, but it's because then they make it about them and, and about, you know, what are they going to get? But it's not about that. And I, I, I will tell you, if you give from that selfless place, you're always going to be fed. You're going to be fed emotionally and spiritually and mentally. But part of that feeding is also taking time for self-care. So I agree with you there. Mm. You have to put on your own oxygen mask before you, uh, before you take care of others. So, yeah. And how do you do your, because um, I know you're also a powerful channel. Um, Ooh, tell you. us about your light language work. Oh, light language. Well, for me, light language started, I think when I was 16, I started speaking light language. And uh I didn't know that it was called light language. I thought it was like heavenly language or angelic language. I really thought about it. I never really thought about interpretation of it. I mm. It was more, to me more musical, you know, not like scatting in, in jazz. It wasn't like, you know, but it wasn't that. It was more, it was just more like the utterances felt so lovely and round and, and, they seem to just flow with this beautiful, they sounded beautiful to me. And it would just be like, once you, once you start speaking, it would just continue until you really decided that's enough now, you know? And I would, I would just sing kind of in that language or I would pray in that language. And, but it was just for me more like, this just feels so beautiful but I didn't know anything about that. It was light language for a long time. And then I knew like the Christian spoken tongues. And I, and I thought, well, that sounds a little familiar, you know, maybe that's the same. And it wasn't until I really started uh, looking into ETs and things like that. And, and I have to say, I am not an ET expert. That was never my thing. I was never, it wasn't until I sort of came into human colony, which was just by 
hook or crook. I don't know why I ended up. <laughs> I started channeling and I was, still wasn't thinking of ETs. I was thinking of uh, uh, higher level entities, but not that they would be ETs. And even the beings I channel aren't really, I don't think, ETs, though they've had uh, lifetimes as extraterrestrials, though they don't talk about it that much. It was just only after asking a million times did they confirm that that was the case. Um, but it, it, I started studying, I think I started doing this radio program called About Oneness on the Enlightenment Evolution Network. And there was a few, and that was Rob Gothier's network, you know, Rob. Mm, yes, yeah. I was on the network. He had seven shows. I was one of the shows. And he was channeling ETs. And I feel like through meeting him, Roxanne Swainhart, a couple other people, Daniel Scranton, who was channeling ETs, I didn't know. I mean, I'd heard of Pleiadians because of, you know, what is that book that was around in the 80s? And I don't even remember uh, Billy Myers' story and, and all that. I mean, I'd heard of these things, but I didn't really have any desire. But in my sort of contact, I think I came across Mary Roswell, if you know who she is. And she did, she had a whole thing on recall and light language and everything. And I was like, wait, I speak, I do that. I do that. So I recorded it and sent it to her. And then she came back to me and she's like, oh, this sounds very much like this person. And that just sort of put me on a path. And somehow Roxanne Swainhart brought me to Human Colony because they had these light language gyms they were doing at the time. People would get together and speak light language. So that's really my story with it. I don't do a lot with it. I still pray in the language, especially if I'm doing like a healing or if I'm deep in, deep in prayer and I don't know what to pray. I just, I just pray in light language. But I, I find it very fascinating you know, you speak beautiful light language. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you have such a I, beautiful, resonant voice too. So <laughs> very, it's like very, uh, there's a lot of bass tones in it and a lot of fullness. It's really beautiful. Yeah. I'm you still speak? learning. I'm still learning. It's a, it's, it's a new that. frequency. You know, there's a frequency that you you feel your body changes. Yeah, it's, no, it's your almost, body changes, your frequency changes, and it's open up a door in yourself, and then this sound comes out. and And I don't know how much my light language has changed. I don't think it's changed that much. I, I the only thing I could say is I'm very because it's been now, you know, a long time. <laughs> I'm in my fifties, and I've been doing since I was sixteen. So, um, well, even as a psychic and as a channel. I don't question anymore. I don't question the source because I know the source. I'm not worried about from where it is coming. I know where it's coming from. And I'm very relaxed in allowing that to come through, whether it's, you know, picking up on whatever's going on with somebody and their family or a psychic reading or in a channeling, allowing, you know, the information to come through or light language. And, and, and the more, that's the one thing you can't, fake, I think, and you can't push. Experience comes in time. It really does. And that allowing comes with the experience of doing. So it's not, you know, a lot of people talk about like when I'm ready and I, and I always say, well, you just have to do it. You can't really prepare other than by doing, you know, you mm -hmm. have to do it. It's like, if you want to sing on stage, I used to be terrified. And I was one of those people who would be, you know, singing and, and scared. And I, my voice would but now I, I, I just go and do, I just love doing it. And I don't think about, uh, you know, what if, what if they think this is bad or, you know, I mean, I don't like it if I'd hit a bad note, but you know, at the same time, you yeah. have to correct I think, it. I think definitely coming out of the mind is key for that language, really mm. coming to trust and surrender. And um, I know lots of people who do become like language channels. They, there that is a process it takes time to really come out of that mind and trust trust in the frequency trust in love mm -hmm. trust that we are unique pieces of infinite intelligence and it's only infinite intelligence that's coming different if you forms can speak light language you can channel i 100 percent know it because it's exactly the same 
It is. We're channeling. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, but I think it takes, it does, because even when we're not speaking like language, we're channeling, you know, I think we're channeling all the time. But yeah. like language is because the language we're speaking, we don't understand it. We can't not, you know, it's going straight into the subconscious. The, the conscious mind is not able to intervene in that process. It's a powerful healing modality. Yeah. But it requires us to trust and surrender. So you I know, totally agree with you that it takes time. That's I feel it. that because it's sound and because it comes from our mouths, that we think that it's words. I don't necessarily think it's words. And I know there's an interpretation of the language, of the, the meaning of the transference of energy. But I, I don't see a lot of people when they're doing healing wondering what the translation is of what that energy that they're bringing forth and healing. And I feel because sound is energy, sound is vibration, I, I don't get so caught up in what does this mean? I, I have to, I have to, in my feeling, I believe so much that it is from this deep wellspring of, of connection to source, it's, it's, it's an energetic transfer that happens to come out of my mouth. It happens to come out in this sound and some of it, you know, if you listen to the music of the spheres, it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And most light language is beautiful. That's, and the beliefs, that belief, the beliefs we hold are so key. Mm -hmm. And I think what you said about you believe that it comes from that wellspring, that spring of love. That is so key. Um, and I and I really agree with you totally. I wanted to know more about what people can expect when they work with you, because you're also a psychic. Honestly, you are so diverse in your talents. I don't know where to begin. You know, when I come for the Ukolo webinars and you are hosting, it's, you know, the way you really work with different multidimensional beings. It's, you know, it's really given me confidence, you know, oh. to do that. So that's really, so thank you for that. Thank you for the work you do. So mm -hmm. I know you're a psychic and you work with, you know, your clients. What can they expect when they come for a session with you? Well, generally in the sessions, I generally mostly do one-to-one. -one, I do uh, channeling sessions. So in that, you know, it, it's a different read than a psychic reading. Psychic readings tend to be more, am I going to get a job? When am I going to meet the love of my life? I'm in this relationship. Does this person love me? Are they cheating on me? They're very mm -hmm. three questions most of the time. So in that way, you know, my, my only goal is to give the information that, that is coming through and to empower the person to make good choices about what they find out. Sometimes they find out what they already know, and I'm just there to reflect to them what they've already said, but to have someone give it to you, you know, in a very, and I'm very, I'm very uh, grounded in, in the way that I talk to people. I don't sell them a lot of stories. I really try to just give them the information as I, as I know it. Um, but in a way so that they can make an informed choice. I believe information good or bad is just information and we have to be brave enough to look at it, you know? And so when we look at it and we can, you know, I, I try to help people to learn to observe as opposed to just react, mm -hmm. to observe and notice and make choices based on what they're, they're finding out, whether it's something they know that's just confirming or something totally that just, I mean, I, I have, I run the gamut of, giving someone information where they're like, no, that's not true. That can't be possible. And then they come back and go, oh my God, you were exactly right. You know? And so, but it's like, once you have information, what is your next choice? What is your next, you know, step? And then it's really about having people understand that even though the future is there, your future is directed by choices we make now. You know, people talk about karma. Well, your karma comes from our choices. Karma just means action. Karma is not some woman standing there with a clipboard going, well, you're going to get it. Though <laughs> your action will create a another action. And you can mitigate. 
you know, good, bad karma. But a lot of times we don't know what that karma is. So it's very important that we make act, that we do things that we're laying a beautiful path so that when whatever we're, the karmic fruits that we're getting are, you know, helping us as opposed to knocking us back a few steps. But I try to help people make choices based on what is in alignment with what they truly want, mm. you know, what they say they want, because that's very important, that integrity of, I say I want to be happy, but yet I'm staying in a relationship where the person doesn't respect me and they don't treat me well, and I'm hoping they're going to be different mm. to empower them to understand that they also have a choice in this situation. And, you know, I mean, that's just one example, but there's just a lot of things and just giving, giving them the tools to move forward in that way. So that's, that's the primary goal of all my readings and, and with channeling, it's the same, but it's, more looking at the deeper, deeper questions that we have about the truth of our reality, the, the truth of who we are as a spiritual being. When I get to answer those questions on a psychic reading, I'm so excited <laughs> because it's <laughs> another level. Every once in a while, I was talking to another psychic and she was like, yeah, but once a week I get one of those people, you know, and then we're all like, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's a great, but, but people who have questions about, am I going to get a job? That's a real important question for them in that moment. They need a job. So that's just as important, but the fun, the most fun is the deep spiritual stuff where people ask Theos a question that I don't, I hundred percent don't know the answer to. And then to hear them just answer these questions in such a beautiful, informative, you know, deep way that is transformative for the person who's listening. I find that to be so exciting. And then that's just generally how the readings are going. So two different, two different styles Mm. And, and with two two sort of more different, I would say psychic readings are more in, about the immediate life, you know, 3D life, my job, my finances, my love, a lot of times my purpose, but, you know, the truest answer, your purpose is to know yourself as divine. But a lot of times when people ask what their purpose is, they mean, what job should I do? But helping them find that way to give themselves permission to pursue what they want, even if it doesn't look like there's a path there and helping them find that. So mm. oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. Because I think sometimes we may have the answers, but because we are truly very wise beings, our true self is that spirit self that is full of oh. wisdom. But it's always helpful to have someone who can help, you know, who can validate, you know, yeah. some of these things that we're already aware of. So we can give ourselves permission. We can give that ego self permission to do certain things because that ego self does need permission sometimes um, and allowing the true higher self to drive to drive everything we do which is what I wrote about in my book oh. this is the book I just I just released it's um it's on it's on Kindle as well I don't know if you can be saying I can't see yeah. oh my goodness it's one of those lighting things. Daily soul bites. So that's yes it's daily soul bites but um it's now on Kindle I might actually read a little piece from it oh please because because I do I do love to read you know there's this section on the empath which I love to read and you know and because we're all empathetic to some degree so this is this is the empath our loving, caring, empathetic self picks, picks up on the thoughts of others. These thoughts can be resonant and in tune with us, or we may pick up thoughts we do not resonate with that cause inner emotional conflicts for us. We can sense that something does not sit right with us, but not know what it is. When we feel this way, we can pause, take time to tune into the thoughts behind the feelings that are off. We can ask ourselves, what am I thinking of? We can write it out or draw it. Get to know what is behind the feeling. The energy behind the thought is yours to manage. As an empath who sincerely cares for others, there's value in sharing a deeper connection and understanding with others or expanding relationships at work or play. So it is good to appreciate this loving self in its totality. We can learn to resolve the inner emotional conflicts, to be attentive, kind, and gentle to our own vulnerable sides. 
As we understand these sides of our own self, we only become more rounded and confident in all that we truly are. So that's the Daily Soul Bites um, on um, empath, the empath. And this is really about alignment, alignment yeah. to the truth of who we are. Um, yeah. and, and there are 31 nuggets, 31 oh. nuggets in the book. And that's just one of them. Um, and I'm really, I'm really ex, you know, excited about sharing all of that. But I wanted to ask about Theos, um, mm -hmm. because you mentioned Theos, and not many people know about Theos. Um, well, they they do know that you channel Theos, but who are they? Tell us a bit more about who they are. Well, you know, my my understanding, oh, sh I, I got to shift because this is important. <laughs> and now I have to talk. Um, my understanding of them has changed over time because I've really been talking to them since I was a little kid. Literally, like five, six years old, I've been talking to them. However, at that time, I didn't call them Theos. I didn't have a name for them. I thought they were God. I thought they were later at my angels. I thought they were my higher self. I, I didn't really, it, it shifted as my understanding of spirituality and the world shifted. And as my mind expanded, I knew they were my teachers very soon after um, after like around eight, I realized they were teachers and they were teaching me. So they would point out things and give me examples and teach me sort of principles, very basic childlike principles, but have turned out to be so, so true. Like one of the things that they taught me was, I was looking at a comic, you know, I, you're in the UK, but in America, we always got the Sunday paper, which was a big deal, the paper, in those days was like this thick and it had all of these sections. And one of the sections was the comics and you would open up this big paper and you would turn the pages. And that was like for a kid, that was their moment for Sunday. And at least in my house and uh, they have, you know, you, you have the little squares that are the comics, you know, one little square is one thing. And then the next one, just like in a comic book. And I was looking in my, I had had, I had the, the newspaper sort of all spread out and, and it was, you know, the comics were all spread out. And they said, do you see those squares? That is how time is. Time mm -hmm. is little moments, all time. And they said, but do you see how these all are all spread out? Well, you think about as that is the past, the present, the future. It's all already there, they said. All time is at the same time, they said. It's just that you that moves from box to box to box, mm -hmm. you know. And so the concept became all time at the same time. And I know that in 19, when I was so young, you know, eight years old, that wasn't common knowledge for an eight-year-old to talk about time as being all at the same time. But I, I knew it to be true. I just knew it. And so it gave me a different perspective on the past, present, future of memory, of future, you know, it maybe helped my psychic ability to be able to see these different things. The other, um, the other big concept was oneness. They talked about oneness. They said, you know, you, there's no difference between you. And they get sort of showed me a bubble and they were like, this is the bubble of everything. And there's nothing, but the bubble has no edge. It has no walls. It's just, everything's in it. And you're part of it but you're not separate from it. And, and I just had these things of like, I had these ideas of like my hand, if I could really see the energy would extend down and through the earth. And, you know, there's, I just, I just had these like concepts. And so they told me that. And then the other thing they uh, expressed to me that turned to be also true is they would say, when you walk in a room, it's there. When you leave, it's not there. This idea of creating, you know, your reality as you move through life. And yes, it's all there, I guess. I mean, I, but it's just this idea of whatever you're focused on, you're creating. And as you leave, mm -hmm. it, it would dissipate. So these are just like little things that I've been teaching or learned when I was, when I was just a kid. And so there came a moment where uh, in 2012, where 
they literally said to me, would you like to know our name? And I thought, I felt first embarrassed because I never thought of them having a name, you know, in like, you know, 30 years or 20 years, whatever it had been at that point, it never dawned on me to ever ask if they had a name or who they were other than my teachers. And so, sorry, my cat was doing so. I just had to make sure he was okay. And, uh, you know, and, and so they gave me the name and they said, we're giving you this name because of what we represent for you, but it's not really who we are. They don't really have a name, though they gave me a name for them. And they, they called themselves Theos. And I said, okay. And what I when I looked it up, it's, it said knowledge of God, that they were my knowledge of God that I was bringing forward. They were that connection. So while I envision them as three beings that are sort of a collective, I always see them standing sort of one, two, three together and sort of semicircle. Mm-hmm. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Um, I don't know if they really have a body, if it's just easier for me to envision them as having bodies, but they are this energy that comes through me that is the deepest understanding that I can muster of the universe. That's the Mm -hmm. best way to say it. And they're loving and they're patient and they're funny and they're kind and they're progressive in their ideas. Very wise, very wise. And they've shown me that like, they're just really on that edge of being a non-being. Like they, they, in my mind's eye, they took me to this sort of shimmery ephemera wall, I would say. And they said, put your arm through the, through this. It, w- it would always be like in a movie where you would see this sort of uh, energy field and you would put your hand through it and maybe walk into a, another world or something. But when I put my arm through it, I literally disappeared. And when I brought my arm back, it was back. So they're from that place, just on the other side of non-existence. They are just that first state of manifestation. So in proximity, they, their knowledge is, they got a big bird's eye view. They really are seeing it from just the other side of creation. They are the projection of the first thought of that. You know, if, if, if creation is just a thought, if, if, if God has a thought and something becomes, this would be that first level, that high, high level. You know, they're not down here where we are. We've gone through, you know, many di- different uh, levels to sort of be here where we're striving to go up. They're up. They're very up there. So, And it's about manifestation, it sounds like. Well, they are. When you talk about the way. Because everything is in waveform until we look at it, until we observe it. And it's our perspectives that turn it into matter. Yeah. But beyond. So I, I love that they are at the very. Nothing. No thing. No thingness. It's that. Yes. You know, in, in the Kabbalah or Kabbalah, however you say it, they, they have the Ain Sof, the Ain, the Ain Sof, and the Ain Sof R. You know, the Ain Sof R is that God force that is manifested. And the Ain Sof is just that you know potential and then the aim is nothing it's nothing so they're somewhere in that little level yeah yeah beautiful beautiful oh that's lovely and what is the name of your um if people want to support you with your dogs i wanted Mm -hmm. to i forget how do they reach you to support you with your dogs to work with you how do they um connect with you for your dogs and for your work? Well, they can go to my uh, website, which is still two names because of my name change. It's karennewman.org, which is Newman is N-E-U-M-A-N-N, or they can go to Krishna Priya Ma, Ma M-A-A. So Krishna Priya is K-R-I-S-H-N-A-P-R-I-Y-A, Ma, M-A-A, dot org. Brilliant, brilliant. That's it's good to spell it for our audio listeners, you know. But we will have all the links, you know, in the description. 
Let's see if it's Krishna Priya Ma. It's KrishnaPriyaMa.com, mm. not .org. Am I right? See, I don't even know myself. <laughs> yes, it's KrishnaPriyaMa.com. Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much, Krishna Priya, for joining me today. Do you want to have any, do you have any final words to say before we go today? No, I just, it's a beautiful pleasure. I'm glad with what you're doing. I think you should read uh, your bites like one uh, before every webinar. That would be so nice. <laughs> and share that. I enjoy it. <laughs> just for people who are, you know, looking for something, you know, it's, it's inside your answers that you're seeking for yourself of what you need to know, what you need to do. And the only thing you have to really say to the universe is I'm willing and ready and able. That's it. And so yeah. all the other things will align for you. Say yes to opportunity. Say yes. Don't be afraid to say yes. I, I, I'll just give you an example before I go. There's a there's a woman that comes to me and she's like, when am I going to meet this guy? And this is very benign, but and I'll say, well, you're going to meet this guy. And she'll, and I'll say, he's this, this, and this. She goes, well, I don't like anybody that's like that. And it's like, okay. <laughs> you know. And, and then, you know, she'll go a period of time ago past. She's like, yeah, I met that guy. I didn't even want to talk to him. And then, you know, another person. And she's like, when am I going to meet the love of my life? And I'm like, well, I, you know, I see that this person's coming in and this amount a month and he has a child. I don't want any man that has a child. Okay. So I, I feel like, the universe really tries to give us what we what we say we want, which is to be happy, to be fulfilled, to live, you know, a good life. But we put so many restrictions on it. It has to be this way. I'm not going to even explore that. And I we miss it. We miss the blessings of what is possible for us because we won't leave our comfort zone. We won't be truly open to that which we don't know, to that which we're you know, we, we think that we know better. I would, I would say if you can get to the place where you realize you know nothing, you're better off than if you think you know absolutely everything. And, you know, that story about, you know, when the guy was drowning and he said, God, please save me. And the police came and knocked on the door. He wasn't drowning. There was a big storm and, and they needed to evacuate everybody. And the police came and knocked on the door and said, sir, we're here. We're going to take you, you know, to safety because the floods are coming. He said, no, no, God will save me. And so he sent the police away. And then all of a sudden the water rot was rising and these people came by in a boat and they said, hey, you know, come on, get in the boat. We're going to take you to say, no, God will save me. You know, I don't like boats. <laughs> and then the guy's on the roof and the water is rising and a helicopter, you know, drops down a line and they say, sir, grab the, grab the, grab the thing. And, and God will, God, you know, not God, will take you to safety. He's like, no, God is going to save me. And so then the water rises and he drowns and he gets to heaven. And, and he said, God, why didn't you save me? Why didn't you help me? And he's like, I sent the police, the fire department, a helicopter. What do you want from me? You know? And life is so like that. We, we think everything has to be a miracle or so big. And it can be so subtle. We have to realize that we are the hands of God in this world. That includes your policemen. That includes your doctors. That includes your, your neighbor. Mm -hmm. God works through us. You know, he, we're, we're God's hands in this world. So be open to that which is being presented to you. At least look at it consider it and don't think that it has to be a certain way. The blessing comes in saying yes and, yes and, what can I do? Yes and. So just like improv, I don't know if you know about improv, but improv is a yes and proposition. Mm -hmm. In improv, if you say yes, and then the scene can continue. But if you say no, it just stops everything. So allow flow is about allowing, allowing. And allowing means accepting and embracing and taking it on and then moving on. And that's not an absolute thing. There are things. It we takes have to compassion. It takes yourself. compassion. For you know, on, on, on our own self and knowing that really nothing is wasted. No experience is wasted. No. Even if you're meeting somebody who is uh, not the right man for you, 
um, that is uh, a stepping stone. It's a learning process. Yeah, what we do with it. And jobs and opportunities. Yes. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, about love. It's about everything, you know. Yes. You know, I, I, I will say that, well, I don't want to continue, but I would just say the reason that I, any big change has come in my life that has propelled me forward is because I said yes. When it came, I, as small as it was, I said yes. And it led to this thing and to that thing. And it's just been this sort of rolling yes. uh, experience. So try saying yes more than no. You know, Believing it, in the best. Believing. Believing that that yes will lead to something that is the next level, the next level, because it never ends. No. You know, we, I think we will always be doing something until we pass from this lifetime. We hope so. You we hope will... <laughs> well, they, they say talk about growth time, if you and sit down and you got to keep going, keep going, keep growing. Have a next thing and a next thing that you want. When you, when you sit down, you just might as well die. You yes, <laughs> yes. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Krishna Priya, for joining me today. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us on this episode. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Daily Soul Bites show. Bye-bye. <laughs>